Agriculture may hold the key to how successfully we humans address climate change. Farming can be part of the problem or part of the solution. In this video, Gary Klappel, a biology professor, talks about how farming can be a major part of the solution. He describes how regenerative agriculture, as practiced on his farm near Albany, New York, can rebuild soils and capture carbon. His practice and research has led to his book, The Emergent Agriculture, Farming, Sustainability, and the Return of the Local Economy. Also speaking is Lauren Williams, Senior Associate Director of National Affairs for the New York State Farm Bureau. She discusses how the American Farm Bureau, the largest organization advocating for farmers, deals with climate change. Introductions are by Jan Storm, who has a doctorate in environmental toxicology and who has worked with farm interests and citizens' climate lobby for the past four years. Their talks were delivered at a regional citizens' climate lobby conference held in the spring of 2019 at Sage College in Troy, New York. I've really been focusing on interacting with farmers and ranchers and even now foresters um, to engage them in climate solutions. Um, and that means both reducing emissions but also removing and storing carbon. So right now I co-lead the National Agriculture Action Team. For those of you that are new, we learned a lot about how we're organized by uh, congressional district into chapters. But nationwide, we're also organized into action teams. And they, they serve a, a number of different roles. Um, right now, the Ag Action Team is serving the role of trying to understand how to bring all of the members of the agriculture sector to the table in a cooperative, collaborative way. And that means focusing more on the solutions that they bring to the table than our solution. So it's a little bit of a challenge. Um, and so we are lucky today, we are so lucky that we actually have people who are in agriculture to talk to you today, not just me. Um, we have Lauren Williams from the New York State Farm Bureau. Yahoo! And uh, <laughs> we also have Gary Clapel and his wife Pam who farm uh, in Knox, New York, mm -hmm. not far from here. So we'll hear some more details from them. Um, first, what I wanted to tell you was why What's the deal with L what is CCL's role here? Uh, why do we care about agriculture? Um, because if you look at the at the bottom map, uh, the darker green, the higher percentage of agricultural or fa farmland. And so basically across the U.S., nearly 40, maybe between 40 and 50 percent of the land is actually agricultural. So you can see it covers a lot of the United States. CCL is a national organization. That is where our constituents are. Those are the people we need to be interacting with. And the top right one is colored, you know, blue or red. So that kind of shows where the more left of center people are and the more right of center people are. And you can see that there's kind of an overlap between farm country and politically right country. And so those are two groups that we really need to build relationships with. Um, this one I just wanted to highlight. This is a cartoon of a farm. And I just wanted to highlight what we all know. If you just look at the size of the arrows, that just kind of gives you a relative comparative sense of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which are typically associated with farmland. And that big pink or purple one, that's actually nitrous oxide. So, and then we also, of course, have uh, carbon dioxide and then methane that we're all familiar with. But what I really want to focus on is this circle down here, which is a carbon sink. And so, normally we don't think of farms as being carbon, uh, carbon removal and storage units, but they are. And that's what we want to focus on. That's what CCL wants to focus on. Um, and why? Because of the magic of photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is actually a technology for capturing carbon, which is millions, if not billions, of years old. 3.2 billion. 3.2 billion, thank you, <laughs> Dr. Capel. <laughs> So this just shows, again, in the presence of energy, sun energy, water, and CO2, plants create mass. 
You ever go out and look at a tree or look at a flower, magically they grow from a tree. Where does that mass come from? It comes from carbon. So they capture carbon, they store it, a plant store it all above ground, and they also move it down into the soil where it is also stored. And the beautiful thing about this, again, is this is proven technology. We really don't need any more research on this. Uh, we do need to scale it up, and it is possible to do that. Um, it, it's available now, as I said, and it mitigates climate change. And the final little slide I have up is this one. So for that again, um, wonks out there, um, there's a huge movement in the scientific uh, literature now to try to quantify exactly what the quantitative benefit would be of maximizing the capacity of not only agriculture, and this is, these are 11 different sort of agricultural practices which can mitigate climate. In other words, by practicing them, you avoid releasing certain emissions and you also capture emissions that are already out there. Um, and what the Nature Conservancy, with a lot of other investigators, have done is they calculated the actual uh, amount of carbon equivalents that would be possible per year if these particular practices, in terms of forest management or agriculture and grassland management and a little bit of wetland management, were scaled up to their maximum capacity in the U.S. Uh, and basically, they calculated that it could account for 21% of our net annual emissions. So that's a, you know, a fifth of the way to our 2030 or 2050 um, goal, whatever you want. And so that's the last that I have. And now I'd like to introduce you. Dr. Gary Lapel and his wife Pam, who's also here, are co-owners and operators of a small and sustainable managed farm in the Hildeberg Mountains, just west of Albany. Um, the Clapels produce grass-fed lamb, fine woolens and fiber crafts, free-range poultry and eggs, and artisan breads while capturing carbon and enhancing the land's ecological functionality. Dr. Clapel's book, the Emergent Agriculture, Farming, Sustainability, and the Return of the Local Economy, describe, which describes the changing paradigm in food production and its effects on the environment, the economy, and society. And he's now working on another book, which is title, entitled, it's a good one, Eden 2.0, How Farming with Nature Can Save the Food System and Maybe the Planet. And I, I want to say this is really reflective of a lot of activity that's going on across the country and across the entire planet with respect to transforming the agriculture system from a conventional fossil fuel based system to a regenerative non-fossil fuel based system mm -hmm. that prioritizes basically healthy soil. Um, and I think I'll that stuff there. Thank you, Jan. Thank you everybody for showing up today when it's 65 degrees out in <laughs> March. You wouldn't think anybody would want to be inside. But um, uh, I'll start by just saying uh, this, is, this is data from EPA as um, interpreted by uh, USDA and the Farm Bureau. Um, and basically, it tells us very clearly that um, the major source is 80% of our greenhouse gas emissions are coming from electrical power production, transportation, and industry. Agriculture. Um, agriculture contributes 9% of our total greenhouse gas emissions. So um, if you took away agriculture, we sold all of our cows to the Canadians, we, we burned all of our crops, um, we would still have 91% left. And so I'm going to argue that um, the U.S. is not a major greenhouse gas source. Um, but I'm also going to suggest that it can be a major greenhouse gas sink, as Jan just mentioned. And I'm going to suggest that it's not farming, but how we farm, that determines um, how well we do with that. So if you ask three farmers 
how to grow anything, you'll get four opinions. Um, and and that's, a, that's, a law, that's a law of physics. Um, but but um, if we were to look at sort of the extremes in agriculture, we might see um, one group of farming or one sort of farming that's based on sort of an industrial model of, of agriculture um, that tends to be large scale, tends to be monoculture based, tends to be input and fossil fuel intensive. And by inputs, I mean um, synthetic fertilizers and synthetic um, biocides, herbicides, and pesticides. Um, and, uh, and, and then you see another kind of agriculture at the other extreme that tends to, for, a better, for lack of a better word, we would call regenerative um, agriculture that um, uh, produ uh, produces um, multiple crops um, and it's focused to some, to a large extent, on restoring soil. It's, that's what we mean by regenerative agriculture. Um, it's catching on big time in the United States. It's um, taking off around the world because it's very productive. It tends to be stable in the in um, in, 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 in 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 a variable environment, um, and it tends to be based not on monocultures but on multiple. Um, production, multiple um, enterprises, um, and it tends to use to focus on using fewer inputs, fewer fossil fuels, less chemistry, more biology. So, um, looking, thinking about that, I'm going to argue that the regenerative model is going to give us better results in terms of carbon capture. Okay. Um, and so how do we do that? We're going to capture carbon, we're going to store that carbon in the ground, we're going to add fertility with livestock, and we're going to reduce fossil fuel use. So um, I've been watching a lot of TV lately because it's March and we don't have that many chores to do. And, um, and one of the things I've heard a lot about is um, the new excitement in engineering is carbon capture. and it's you know, at the point source, in the air, and it's expensive, and it's complex, and as Jan pointed out, um, we've had sort of the physical plan for this for about <laughs> 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 Okay, so, yeah, sorry. Everything from algae to sequoias have been capturing carbon for a very long time. We know the technology works. Yeah. Um, and the way it works, as Jan pointed out, is carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight are used to create three and four carbon sugars, which are then um, combined with other molecules to make larger sugars, um, starches, uh, lipids, and proteins, and other chemicals. And that process is called photosynthesis. The plant uses it for growth, metabolism, and then whatever's left over is stored largely in the roots, which, according to this diagram, is in the soil. Okay. <laughs> Some of the substances that the plant makes will be exuded into, um, into the soil and into an area we call the rhizosphere. And this is about as technical as I'm going to get. But basically, the rhizosphere is just full of bacteria and fungi, which are going to help digest organic materials, which are going to communicate with the plant. So the some of the bacteria that will actually be produced here, and the more, more exudates that come into the soil, the more diverse the bacteria get. And in a paper I published just this week, um, the more diverse the bacteria, the faster plants grow. And so we're making more photosynthetic carbon capture devices by um, fostering good bacteria in the soil. Okay, and the the um, bacteria will will actually communicate with the plant. And if the plant gets sick with a fungus or is attacked by a by an insect, the bacteria will actually make um, chemicals which um, which force the invader away, or which help to cure the plant. So this is an enormously, we call it sing, chemical signaling, this is an enormously important biological system. Okay. And 
the um, bacteria and fungi will also help to stabilize the carbon in the soil. We call that humus. Has anybody heard of Wes Jackson? Yeah, yeah he's pretty cool. Yeah. He, he's, if you know Wes Jackson, you know he's not given to, to exaggeration. Okay? But he's a, 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 a geneticist who had a, a faculty position at, at uh, uh, Cal State, hum, Humboldt State University in uh, California. Huh. And uh, he left that about 25 years ago and, um, and created the Land Institute in Kansas. And at the Land Institute, he's been studying the development of perennial grains. And perennial grains, um, for anybody who grows crops, you know that an annual plant grows, its seeds are either collected or dispersed, but the plant dies. And usually you have to buy new seeds. If you're harvesting the, the grain for flour, you have, to, um, you have to buy new wheat seeds every year because the plant died. Perennial wheat doesn't die. It goes dormant in the winter, and then it grows back. And all this time, it's putting carbon into its roots. He showed us pictures of roots that are 20 feet long. This is all carbon. Okay, this is conventional wheat. There's, there's the root. Here's the root. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. He says that if you plant this all over the Great Plains, we will bring carbon levels back to pre-industrial levels. He's not. He doesn't exaggerate. Okay. So I haven't done the math, but he has. Um, when we get carbon in the soil. It's necessary to keep it in the soil. How do we do that? We do it by armoring the soil. What is armor? This is armor. It's colored green. If we have green stuff on the soil, carbon and water go in and stay there. If we don't have green stuff on the soil, carbon and water leave. How do we do that? Well. By not breaking the surface of the soil, this is no-till seeding. By cover cropping, here are the, here's the crop, here are the cover crops. In the fall, those cover crops are going to be um, pushed into the soil and turned into fertilizer. By leaving residues, after we've harvested, just leave the crop residues covering the soil and even by animal impact. These are some of my sheep taking down an invasive plant. And when they leave, and they're, they're, they're bunched really tightly together. That way, one of them doesn't say, well, I don't really like that plant. But the other guy might, so I'm going to eat it. Okay, so, <laughs> so that's the way sheep behave. We're using their behavior to remove an invasive species. And then they leave, and the ground is nicely covered. Okay. We've got armor on the soil. These are bison. They're not mine. Um, <laughs> but notice how closely packed they are. Bison wild ungulates, wild herbivores, bunch tightly together because they have predators. And because they have predators and they're bunched tightly together, they're urinating and defecating on their food supply. So they have to constantly move. Okay. These are cows on pasture. Notice how spread out they are. Okay? Very few cows, and we think that this is light grazing, so it's not going to damage the soil. But that's not what the cow is thinking. The cow is thinking, I can select whatever I want, and they'll eat their favorite food, and then they'll go into another patch and eat their favorite food there. And pretty soon, if you can see these bare spots all around the pasture, and then it rains, and the pasture is wiped out, and carbon and water leave the soil. These are my sheep again. Um, they're bunched at a density of about the equivalent of three tons of live weight per acre. That's about three times what the average farmer, conventional farmer, would do. You notice this little um, white thing? That's a fence. It's very lightweight. It weighs 15 pounds. But there's a little fence charger there, which is putting 8,000 volts on that fence. Anything inside the fence is going to stay in it, and anything outside the fence is going to stay out. 
till I turn off the fence charger, move the fence, move the sheep, and that happens every single day. And this, when they leave, this is what the pasture looks like. Armored and covered with manure. So they've urinated, that's fast release fertilizer. And they've defecated, that's time release fertilizer. And the fungi that we've talked about are going to make that carbon into soil. And this is what my pasture looks like. It doesn't look like a bunch of red squares, really. <laughs> There's only one fence, but every day I move the, 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 um, the sheep to another paddock, a, a subdivision of my pasture. It takes 37 days to get around that pasture. At any time, 6% of the pasture is being grazed, 94% is resting. In other words, the plants are photosynthesizing, they're doing their thing, and capturing carbon without any disturbance. What happens? Well, this is again from the paper I just published. This is um, the bacterial biomass in the soils in 21 pastures that are managed by this multi-paddock system. And you can see it contains significantly more bacteria or microbe, microbes, bacteria and fungi in the soil than either a conventionally managed pasture or a hayfield. There's no difference in the microbial biomass with hayfields and, um, and, and, uh, multi and conventionally managed pastures. Does that make sense? Yeah. So do the same thing in East Texas. Richard Teague at Texas A&M and his, and his uh, colleagues have looked at the same process and they found the same thing. Multi-paddock systems are, um, are produce more microbial biomass in the soil than conventionally managed systems. In the Heldebergs, where we live, the average soil organic matter is between 3 and 6%. On our farm, it's 7.7%. <coughs> okay. Same thing in Texas. Okay, Democrats, Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> Real Republicans. This is Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, Gabe Brown's ranch outside of Bismarck. He bought the ranch in, and he does, he's running 350 head of beef cattle, a flock of sheep, two flocks of chickens, bees, and many vegetables, cover crops, and fruit. Okay? So he's a hardcore farmer, 5,000 acres. When he bought that farm in 1993, whoops, I'm supposed to be here. Um, there was 1.7% organic matter. Today, 11%. That's astounding. The French say if we all did that, we would stop the increase in climate in carbon in our atmosphere. That's called the 4 by 1,000 um, project. Be right with you. Okay, finally, I used to mow my fields every day. Uh, uh, every year, I'm sorry, <laughs> couldn't do it every day. Then I realized I had 30, I had 30 lawn mowers in my barn, and so I put them to work. They liked the work, and what I noticed is the variety, what we call species richness, the number of plant species in my pastures went from about four to 12 um, in when I didn't mow. Okay. And then four years later, I'm up to about 50 species of plants. Okay. Now, why is that? What does that have to do with climate change? When all of these different um, photosynth uh, carbon carbon collectors are working under all different conditions, I'm putting a lot more carbon into my soil. And by the way, I've cut my diesel use by 70 percent. And that translates both into over a ton of carbon that I'm not putting into the atmosphere and a lot more money that I'm keeping in my pocket. So it makes economic sense. You still have to feed them. The sheep? In the winter, yeah. Oh, in the winter, yes. 
Well, winters are long here. And this yeah. Is yeah. Be we can discuss that. Let yeah. me just. Yeah. So, and by the way, we kept we kept our sheep out until late January this year. So, oh. Yeah. I can explain how. Yeah. But it has to do with diversity of your plants. Um, so, what's the bottom line? How much can can um, farmers do? How much carbon can we sequester? Well, currently, the University of Florida says we're doing between four and a half and nineteen percent. Okay, really poor, minimal efforts at carbon sequestration, large effort, efforts. Professor Ratan Lal, or distinguished professor of soil science, uh, science Ratan Lal, um, of Ohio State University, says we can do 25% globally, which is very close to what Jan said. A paper just came out last year from Michigan State um, where they project that in the United States, we can remove 32% of the carbon um, that is of our carbon emissions in the United States, U.S. carbon emissions, through the kind of agriculture that I've just described. So, how do you do it? Use plants to capture carbon, use microbes to stabilize uh, soil carbon and improve fertility, use soil armor to store carbon, use livestock to cultivate microbes and to add fertility, and you use less fuel. It's not about how we about farming. It's about how we farm, and that's my story. I'm not. Let's see what time. Oh, you want me to? Excuse me. Can you go back one slide? Leave that. Yeah, that last That's slide. a lot of information up there that was really yeah. helpful. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah. I wanted to go to, oh, so you want no, to leave that, that, oh, that slide? No, that, 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 that up. This one. No, no, no. no, 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 no. Next one. With all the uh, sub-labels. There you yeah. go. Perfect. Are these slides going to be available? Yeah. Sure. The, the young grenadine. Um, yeah, so do, I think we probably have time for a question or two. Um, okay. Yeah, this guy has been raising his hands since I almost opened my mouth. I've got two questions in, okay. in general about agriculture, and uh, one of them is, uh, does the 9% contribution from agriculture include the amount of uh, natural gas that's used to make the uh, anhydrous ammonia? Do you know? I don't know. I can't answer that, honestly. Okay, the other question I have is, um, in no-till agriculture, yeah. um, normally they use Roundup to control the weeds. And, um, I've heard from uh, some farmers that the Roundup kills the, the uh, rhizo, rhizosphere and... The rhizomes, yeah, go ahead. And, and uh, causes soil compaction and uh, the soil is no longer able to absorb the amount of water that it normally could. It's, it's, more, it's, it's worse than that. Yeah. So here's the... And I'm, this, this is something that if you go to Acres USA meetings, um, there is a real, you know in science there are always debates, there is a real debate between tilling and no tilling. Um, and it's not settled yet. But I really, I spoke to the, the executive director of the Rodale Institute about this. And he feels this way. And Ratan Lal will say the same thing. If you need to um, use Biocides. To me, that is obscene. But I don't. I haven't had to use biocides. Um, when we have a weed problem, we go and pull out the weeds. Okay. Um, we have an issue right now. We leave the the goldenrod on our fields, not because the sheep like it, because they don't, but because the bees use it as their last um, food supply um, before they go to sleep in the winter. So, um, but there are too many golden rods now. So what I'm gonna do, using fossil fuels, I'm going to start my weed whacker, and I'm gonna go golden rod by golden rod and select a thinning protocol to thin my golden rods. Um, 
There are some farmers who believe that you should till at certain times, and my neighbor who has been, um, who has been living in the Heldebergs, for three, well, his family has been there for three generations, says you, can't, you have to till because otherwise the clay won't break down. You, the, by tilling, you open up the clay. So this is a hard question to answer. Um, but what the director of the Rodale Institute said is you do, you do as little damage as you can. So if you know your, first of all, glyphosate sucks. Um, you should, I don't think you should, you should find something besides glyphosate to put yeah, vinegar right. on it. That's yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Roundup. Um, it, it's a terrible chemical. That said, um, if you need to use it, and you're managing 5,000 acres, and you need to use it in a certain place, that's the decision that you have to make. And that's what you, and you have to live with those consequences. Okay. Um, the people who are doing that no-till kind of agriculture are really concerned about, um, about what they're doing to the environment to produce food and fiber. So at this point, there's no real good answer to you. That's a very good question. But it's something that the community will work, will figure out. I believe that. Does that so, help? Thank you. Yeah, so let's, can I get off of this one? And yes. then we'll go on. Okay, so. Um, Thanks, that's good. Thank, thank you. you. So the other thing, the other thing about the type of farming that Gary is talking about is the tremendous co-benefits that really um, convene to the entire community and not only the farmer. And so when these types of analyses are done, they really, you can see that they really also categorize all of the co-benefits with this. And in terms of a farmer, um, it makes healthy soil makes his or her farm more resilient. It holds, it holds more water. Uh, in drought, so it doesn't dry out so much. It, it allows greater water filtra filtration during rainy events, so the water filtrates, it doesn't flood. Um, it, it is more nutritious, so it keeps the microbiome uh, happy and alive, and so it can deliver more nutrients and the right kind of nutrients to the plants, in addition to do, doing all of the disease type prevention that plants actually talk each other and the microbes it's amazing they're pretty smart yeah so um, all of these regenerate all of these regenerative practices are fundamentally founded in healthy soil creating healthy soil and that healthy soil has benefits in terms of clean air biodiversity um, well soil obviously and water quality and so and the biodiversity also um, makes farms more resilient to extreme weather and changing weather because with a more diverse above ground and below ground biome you can respond better. So I just wanted to add that because mm -hmm. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let me get Lauren's um, thing Could you talk a little bit more about your sheep and how long you got to keep them on during the year? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, what we started doing was called stock how about in the microphone so it can be on the recording? Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to do that, Jim? Um, quick, yeah. Okay. Just, I'll just not wait. too long. Okay. <laughs> you know me, I'm... Yeah. I've never talked to me. Um, yeah, they, the, the sheep, to, basically, they're, the most expensive part of our operation is hay. Okay, so we buy our hay, and that, that can just destroy your profitability. Believe it or not, that's what farming is about, is making a living. Okay, so we put our, we try to keep our sheep out as long as possible. So um, toward the end of the, that, rot our last rota our late rotations in the season, instead of keeping the sheep out on a paddock for one day, they're on for two days, um, usually, not always. Um, and then we use, we plant, um, we have something called tall fescue. Sheep hate tall fescue. It's hard to digest and everything else. But, um, in this fall, when it starts to rain, it starts to make the tall fescue right really mushy, and then the sheep love it. So we fence in a big area 
And I wish I brought the slide, but January 21st, picture of sheep out there just enjoying the 12 fescue. Um, so yeah, so we can have, we might run up against the clock, um, but both Gary and Lauren have agreed to carry on the conversation back in the rotunda near the, near the ag table if you continue to have questions. Um, but right now I would like to introduce Lauren uh, Williams. and I. One of the things we do in CCL, of course, is we want to reach out to people like Gary and other farmers so that we can figure out how we can work together to solve this climate crisis because we want to put a price on carbon as well as amplify the ability to store, to uh, capture and store. One, we also need to understand what happens on Capitol Hill and probably the biggest and most important advocate on behalf of big of agriculture in general on Capitol Hill is the American Farm Bureau Federation. So it's it's really, really important and I'm I think it's organized by Lauren will go through how it's uh, organized, but I just want to say New York State is a great farm bureau. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and I don't think we can say that for all of them. So, um, <laughs> so Lauren is the Associate Director of National Affairs at the New York Farm Bureau, where she's responsible for directing and coordinating New York Farm Bureau's federal lobbying efforts, developing and implementing short and long-term lobbying strategies, establishing and maintaining a, right, a working relationship with New York's senators and congressional delegation, as well as their staff. Um, she also handles labor and, labor and environmental issues at both the state and federal level, and she grew up on her family's dairy farm in southeastern Pennsylvania, uh, and mm -hmm. then on, went on to earn a degree in natural resources and animal sciences. So another farmer. <laughs> <laughs> we tried. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, so as Jan said, I do national affairs for New York Farm Bureau, um, whole host of issues that fall under our umbrella. Um, so just a little bit of background as us as an organization, you know, learning more about CCL, just wanted to give some background on Farm Bureau and kind of who we are. Um, so we're this, well, New York's largest ag, general ag organization. Um, we were founded in 1911. So we've been around for 100 years, which kind of gives us a little bit of pride in that. Um, so our grass, our advocacy is all grassroots based. So all our Farm Bureau members, they set all of our policies. As staff myself, I don't set um, the policies on what we're going to advocate for. Um, we leave that up to our members. Um, so New York membership is about 20,000 members. Majority of that is farmers, but then we have people who support agriculture or really care about agriculture as well. And as Jan said, we have a national organization, and under that um, American Farm Bureau, there's about 6 million members in that. Um, again, both farmers and supporters of ag. We lobby um, at the, both the state and federal level on ag issues um, and represent all commodities, all farm sizes, all production methods. So, you know, we're representing 50 cow dairy farms, but we also represent the 5,000 cow dairy farms in New York. Um, and sometimes different opinions and different um, outlook on what ag means for them, but, you know, we try and focus on issues like taxes or labor. Um, that really impact a farmer's bottom line at the end of the day. And we also partner with other farm organizations, other environmental groups, and other general business organizations on that whole host of issues. So just want to give some background on farming in New York. I know some of you guys are from other states, um, but just a little bit perspective. There's about 35,000 farms in New York. The new ag census is due out hopefully soon. <laughs> um, so that'll... Um, give us a broader perspective of what that looks like. And about 98% of farms are family owned, and maybe that's just one family unit on the farm, or maybe that's um, grandfather, granddad, and then the daughter has returned home to the farm, or there's multiple siblings now at the farm. So about 25% of the state's land is in farmland, and I think going off of what Gary point, there's lots of opportunity in that quarter percent of New York State to work on um, carbon sequestration and really address how we can work with farmers on climate change. And the average farm is 206 acres, which is smaller than probably the national average where we have larger farms um, in the Midwest. $5.2 billion in sales in 2017, so a large part of the economy in New York State, especially for upstate New York. And dairy is our largest portion, um, so about half of our farm economy is from dairy and we're ranked fourth nationally, which I think um, 
puts us in a good perspective to provide um, comparing with like California or Texas where some of those average sized farms or dairy farms are about a thousand cows probably are actually going at the ag statistics we're about a hundred cows so just how we compare that different statistic and then farm diversity and crop diversity we have organic farms we have large conventional farms as well and then just a little bit of bragging about New York agriculture because I think sometimes people don't realize how impactful the ag um, industry is in New York um, especially when you know there's big leaders like California and Florida that are producing a lot of produce but they have more seasonal opportunities given you know we usually have about one season to grow everything so big on dairy products we're actually second in apples snap beans and maple so hopefully you guys are all hitting up your maple weekends um, and enjoying that and then grapes cabbage total Italian cheeses so some random products in there but um, we're good leader than um, milk um, total cheeses corn salad is fourth and then tart cherries and chaos is fifth so lots of random things that we're good at um, but I think that really adds to diversity of New York State agriculture so agriculture's role in climate change. <laughs> I was really looking for an opportunity to use this picture. Like, uh, agriculture and where that all fits in. So I think, you know, animal agriculture, cow farts or cow flatulence has become a real trigger word. And, you know, kind of saying, yes, cows do emit, um, livestock do emit. How can we capture some of that into making that an energy source or being, being able to do, reduce emissions? And I think what we're really gonna talk about that Gary and um, Jana both really highlighted on is we're able to serve as a carbon sink. You know, we have weather resiliency. Instead of hit, rain hitting pavement and kind of just going fast off the land, can a, you know, a rain event hit farmland where the water's able to filter in um, and be able to go through that process. And then renewable energy, um, anaerobic digesters, and recycling food waste. Is there an opportunity um, to really address food waste, both on the farm as well as coming off of grocery stores or other sources of food. And so Gary did a really great job of pointing this out, um, some of the newest numbers from um, EPA on climate emissions. So agriculture is up here in the red, um, transportation and energy is down here. And then I think the other really key thing to point out is this green, which is actually serving as a carbon sink is land use, land use changes, and forestry. So one of the other things that farmers, you know, they have a lot of land, but they have a lot of forestry as well as an accessory to their farm. So to be able to use that forest as a carbon sink or kind of get some credit for that, I think is really important. So primary sources of ag-related greenhouse gases, just so we know where the numbers are coming from. Um, crop cultivation represents about 50% of the greenhouse gases. So that's inputs from fuel, um, using to plant or plow or harvest um, crops and also you know other inputs um, like fertilizers livestock production that represents represents about 42 percent of greenhouse gases associated with agriculture and two-thirds of meth methane emissions um, that should be livestock emissions um, are from enteric fermentation so that's um, so we call them ruminants those are sheep cattle um, goats they have a large stomach which has four chambers and in their large chamber they're like they are processing um, different the grasses they eat and so some of that comes out when they um, when they burp so that's what enteric methane is um, so when they're burping um, is a really can be a, an emitter and then mesh, methane emissions from ruminants are about a quarter of total methane emissions across the board um, realizing that methane has a larger impact than carbon and how do we manage um, those methane emissions but I like to see some positives in there and say that livestock those emissions can form um, a source of energy doing less with more um, and I don't know if anybody has ever seen the statistics about how we've gotten we've gotten really good at producing food in the US um, you know productivity in agriculture is 270 percent greater um, now than it was in 1948 so some of that you know we've been able through crop breeding you know selection of plants um, we're able to get more out of you know basically keeping constant um, with our inputs so some gains there that 
can say we're able to produce more with less emissions on a total basis. And then decreasing methane emissions from livestock. Um, really, we've seen some really good productivity gains in intensity of greenhouse gases from livestock. So I think these are some really good numbers. This is um, from Frank Mitliner. He's a researcher at a UC Davis um, and has done a lot on livestock emissions. So back in 1950, we had 200, 22 million dairy cows, and now we have about 9 million cows, and we're producing a lot more milk. So we've gotten, you know, through breeding, through better understanding how to feed animals, we've gotten a lot more efficient. So per production of milk or per production of beef pounds, we're able to reduce our methane emissions. And then this is, a, I don't know if you want to say a fun little graph, but a <laughs> nice graph that shows. So in the US, we have one cow who is emitting um, 500 grams of methane, whereas in um, India, this um, 10 cows represents this one cow in the US. So are there opportunities in other countries to work on efficiency? Um, and really get production that is able to feed people, but also that's sustainable as well. So talking about New York Farm Bureau as an organization, where do we lie on climate policy or climate resiliency? Um, and kind of like I said before, sometimes climate change can be a trigger word for some of our members. We do represent all um, broad spectrum. So we have members who are on the far right. We have members who are on the far left. Um, so we balance that out and say we've had a lot more extreme weather events here in New York, be it from storms, drought, um, frost, um, and how do we manage that? Pests, if we, you know, some winters have been really moderate, so if we don't get those deep kills, um, our pests coming back, like the brown marmorated stink bug, is able to come back a lot easier the next year. So how do we manage that and how do we work with um, Cornell Cooperative Extension or other organizations to help manage that? and then resiliency and sustainability, be it through management, crop varieties. And when we talk about um, farm sustainability, both environmentally and business sustainability, because I think you know, it's great if you have an environmental practice that's gonna um, help a farm be more resilient, but it also has to help them with their bottom line because farmers are in a tough economy and you know, they love the land and love what they do, but if it doesn't make business sense, why, are we, why would they keep operating? So a lot of our state policy focuses, you know, again, on resiliency, soil health, aid to state programs that I'm going to talk about a lot of the programs that are helping our farmers. And then we do support um, a carbon, carbon farming pilot program, which basically would reward farmers for putting in more um, carbon friendly practices. And then we did work on a letter to the governor. If anybody wants to see it, we worked with a whole broad group of um, ag organizations and um, just general businesses talking about how we can do more in the state to benefit farmers who are working on climate. Then national policy, again, national policy is representing, um, as Jan showed, those red states in the middle um, and in the south. So we really favor voluntary market-based systems and our policy does oppose any type of carbon tax. Um, you know, talking with Jan, you know, how a carbon fee would fit into that um, where we can kind of meet in the middle to maybe, you know, either um, find some type of compromise. And I know um, that doesn't answer our questions of where we're going to be on that bill, but I think at this point we're just no position um, and looking to see how we can um, work on that together. So some state programs, and I feel like this is acronym soup, so if I get, if I talk about EEM or, um, Ag non-point source or anything like that, just stop me and um, I can kind of explain the programs. But I think we're really um, in a great standpoint, standing point here in New York that we have a lot of great programs that are able to help our farmers. So the one um, first program is the Ag Environmental Management Program, or AEM, and that helps farmers put in conservation plans on their farms to say, what can I do on my farm to be more resilient, more environmentally friendly? Um, and as Gary talked about, that might include um, planting cover crops, that might input a stream crossing. You know, I think we always see that idyllic picture of the cows in the stream and from the 1950s, and it's like, oh, how great that is, but it's like, don't put your cows in the stream because <laughs> <laughs> they're dropping something there. Yeah. So that gives us a way to preserve um, the stream bank, but while still doing um, 
rotational grazing or other types of grazing management. And then we have two programs that which provide cost share to farmers. So um, the Climate Resilient Farming Program really provides, narrows down to those practices that help our farmers um, be more resilient. Um, so it's the cover crops, manure storage cover, um, rotational grazing. Um, and so a lot of our farms um, have manure storages and if you're able to keep the clean water that's coming down as rain out and use that in another source so it doesn't become contaminated when it comes into your manure storage. And then Ag Nonpoint Source, again, it's a really good cost share program that helps farmers implement environmental conservation programs. Farmland Protection, um, this is a really good program that I think has a lot of benefits to New York, and I'll show you um, a slide at the end that really shows that. But basically it's preserving farmland and kind of delaying any type of development. Where a farmer sells his development rights, he can still sell the farm to whoever he wants, but the new owner isn't allowed to put houses or commercial buildings on that. So it has a twofold of you keep this beautiful landscape of agriculture in New York, but you're also preserving that carbon sink um, for future benefits. And then Cornell has a really great program. It's called the Climate Smart Farming Program, where it provides research that focuses on how farmers um, can be more resilient on what practices they may need. There's an extension team that you can call out to your farm and say, hey, I'm having issues um, with water runoff or soil runoff, how can we work on that? And they can provide that. There's also decision tools for farmers. So if you're an apple farmer, this one um, kind of provides info on when you might see some freeze and frost dates. So if you have a mild winter, and your apple trees start blooming or start budding out and there's a frost, there's the potential that you're going to lose your crop for the year. So are you able to kind of map when those frost dates may be and how can, are there technologies that you can put in um, that would help abate that frost damage and so you can have a crop. Federal programs, again, very similar to um, the state programs. There's EQIP CSP, which provides cost share programs. Um, and then there's the Conservation Reserve Program, which actually takes um, marginal farmland out of production. And the farmers paid a rental fee to plant um, a cover crop or a full grass cover on that field so that, you know, when the water hits it, it's not eroding like a steep slope anymore. And then there's also another um, farmland preservation program at the national level. And then there's also um, a program where you can basically, you know, carbon footprinting, I think that was popular, you know, I remember doing that in college, that was a real big thing. So you're able to map your carbon footprint on your farm. And then soil health, and I don't know if anybody's ever seen these demonstrations, it's really cool. Um, so basically, you put water in on all these types of field um, examples. And so with this field, there's no cover. You see how dirty and brown that water is? That would be modeled you know, on a big field if there's no cover. While over here where there's this nice lush grass, you know, that water's pretty clear. So again, you know, educating farmers on these practices and why we keep the ground covered or other opportunities to even just leave residue on top of the farm if you can't get a cover crop planted. So applied research, um, just looking at an example that's actually helping, this is in the Chesapeake Bay through Cornell, um, kind of mapping how we can feed cows more efficiently and reduce the nitrogen in their diets, which means they're excreting less nitrogen, which if you're in the Chesapeake Bay, you've got a um, TMDL or total maximum daily load to meet. So being able to do that and creating a whole farm plan on how you can feed your cows more efficiently so you have less inputs and therefore less outputs. This is my last one. Okay. You're good. good. So I think other areas of opportunity, food waste. Are there opportunities to donate food um, that a farmer isn't able to get into the processing or may not meet the market standard? Also recycling processing food into, a, a, into, their, into the cow ration. You know, you see these waste carrots here. Instead of going to landfill, can we feed them to cows um, along with the other hay that they're eating? And then composting it or either putting it in an anaerobic digester um, to help you know, ferment that and create an energy source rather than just going to a landfill or land applying the manure before it goes through the digester. 
And so this is the one I really wanted to, I think, highlight. It was um, American Farmland Trust, which has a group here in New York. Um, basically, keeping an acre of farmland in production reduces greenhouse 66 um, times fewer greenhouses than an acre of developed land, which I think is really good to say that, you know, ag's an important part of this and how do we keep us in production. So we're, we're really